So we have everybody here with us. The voice you're hearing is Sabrina Britt, and this is our logo here with the Yellow Basin Foundation. I'm the volunteer coordinator with the Yellow Basin Foundation, and we are the nonprofit that does the education surrounding the Yellow Bypass Wildlife Area. Sorry about that. Technical issues. Thank you for your patience. We bring you the vertical speaker series in partnership with Grasslands Regional Park. We're having a grant program that we've received with them through the Habitat Conservation Fund grant program. And so we are working with them to provide educational opportunities um, all about the Grasslands Regional Park. Just a little bit of that. And you get a lot more from one of our speakers tonight on this. The Grasslands Regional Park is located just south of the city of Davis at the corner of Mace Boulevard and Tremont. And it's about four miles south of Interstate 80. Um, the park is also just about three to four miles southwest of the Yellow Bypass Wildlife Area, if you are familiar with that. The Yellow Bypass Wildlife Area is what you draw when you drive over the Yellow Causeway on the 80 freeway. Those are the wetlands that sit below that. And so in conjunction with this grant, just a little bit of background for those of you that are joining us for the first time for our speaker series. This might be a little repetition for those of you that are coming back since this is our third talk. But this is a five-year grant project. And we are working with them to do public outreach and education. So as part of that, we're putting on the Vertical Speaker Series that you're here for tonight. And our last one is coming up on May 11th, Tuesday at 7 o'clock p.m. on the plants of our Vernal Pools with botanist and vertical expert Kara Witham. We are also doing virtual tours of our local wetlands. And if you go to yellowbasin.org to our virtual tours page, then you can register for these free virtual tours because the vernal pools are not accessible to the general public. They are protected, which you'll hear more about tonight. Um, we are doing virtual programs from there to show you what's out there. And especially with uh, our current um, pandemic situation as well. We wanna keep you safe at home. We're also doing virtual Discover the Flyway, which are virtual school programs for students in kindergarten through 12th grade. And so we have activities that they can do. Um, they log in just like you through Zoom and they get hands-on experiences. So we give them materials in order to um, create a critter that they learn about from the vertical pool. I do hear some feedback, so if you can please uh, mute yourself, that would be greatly appreciated. So without further ado tonight, I'd like to introduce our speakers. We have Chris Alford tonight, who is going to start us off speaking about a history of Grasslands Regional Park. And then we have John McNerney, who is following her um, with the Burrowing Owls Preserve that is out there at Grasslands Regional Park. Chris Alford comes to us from Alford Environmental LLC. She's an environmental consultant. And John McNerney comes to us from the city of Davis and he is a wildlife resource specialist. So I'm gonna turn it over to Chris. And Chris, if you can unmute yourself. Yep. And I've pinned Chris for you. And Chris will go ahead and share, screen share um, her PowerPoint. Oh, I will mention if you have any questions throughout the time tonight as Chris is pulling up her PowerPoint, please do send them um, to me at says Sabrina dash Yolo Basin Foundation. And I will field your questions at the end of our time together to both Chris and John. All right. Can you guys see the first slide? 
Yes, we have thumbs up for that. Thumbs up. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, all right, with that, we'll get going. I'm trying to figure out my screen setup. Um, well, thank you for that, Sabrina. Um, as Sabrina mentioned, my name is Chris Alford. Um, I'm currently with Alford Environmental and the owner of, of um, Environmental Planning Company. But at the same time, um, my experience at Grafton's Regional Park really started back in 2006 when I was a natural resources planner for Yolo County. So I was a natural resources planner managing several of the county's properties, including Grafton's Regional Park from about 2006 to 2008. Um, and then I was also asked by um, the county's general services manager to come back as a consultant um, to help with the management and fulfilling some of the grants that were associated with the restoration and management of Grasslands Regional Park from 2010 to 2012, which I'll discuss a little bit later on. Um, before I dive into the presentation overall, I just wanted to say that I am thrilled that the Yolo Basin Foundation and the Yolo County have partnered on this effort. Um, and especially the Yolo, the, the Yolo Basin Foundation is working on developing the educational program and the docent training that's centered around the vernal pools at Grasslands Regional Park. Um, the site is generally accessible to the public. As Sabrina had mentioned, the, the pools themselves, you can't walk directly into them, but the fact that it is a public property and the open space areas are managed for the natural resources components on those sites um, provide a really important and special Kind of opportunity for folks to learn about the vernal pools, the grasslands, and to provide a little bit of a, a small window into what the broader landscape around this area of the Central Valley once looked like. Um, it's my hope that um, as part of, of the Yellow Basin's efforts that more people really become aware of the special nature of vernal pools and grasslands in general, as well as the uniqueness of the ones at Grasslands Regional Park, and that there'll be an increased interest in the conserving and then also actively and appropriately managing these natural resources for the future. Um, and, and I say manage, I think sometimes people think of, of some of these remnant landscapes as things to kind of lock up and put away, but I do say manage because even though, um, as I'll explain, the, the vernal pools and the grasslands on this site are um, kind of less impacted than many of the other vernal pools and grasslands in the area that have either been um, severely impacted or eliminated entirely, they're not without uh, human impact, whether um, intentionally or unintentionally, um, directly or indirectly. There definitely have been a lot of activities both on and around this, this area that have impacted this particular site. So um, tonight I want to just kind of go over a general history of both the natural history and the human history of kind of how these pools are um, and have come to be and, and how they were shaped from a natural perspective and then why we see them the way that we do today. So hopefully it'll help you um, as you either see the virtual vernal pool tours or get to learn more about the site um, that you can kind of appreciate and have some context for how they came to be how they are now. Um, so Sabrina had mentioned, um, here's a location map of where Grasslands Regional Park is in the context of both the Yolo Basin Wildlife Area as well as the city of Davis and the Yolo Basin Foundation's office. You can see that Grasslands Regional Park is off of Mace Boulevard or County Road 104, directly south of Davis, about four miles. Um, and when folks think of Grasslands Regional Park, they often are talking about what is the current um, county-owned public park. It's the 320-acre area that's in this darker green color um, identified within the um, dark green square. When I'm referring to Grasslands Regional Park, I'm often either saying Grasslands Regional Park and the Davis sites or just Grasslands Regional Park. And I'm actually referring to that entire green square because it's an area that um, is a single section parcel. And it's um, there are two parcels on the site, but it's a complete section. And as we'll see when I start to show you the maps of the site, the hydrology of the vernal pools and just the overall landscape and open space areas are very much connected. And um, the county's actually been historically managing both properties, even though the eastern property is still owned by the federal government. Um, Yolo County's kind of taken on responsibility for the management of the open space and the natural resources on that portion of the section since, I believe, around 2004 or 2005. And we set up a formal agreement uh, with the Department of Defense in 2006. Um, so to give you some context of kind of the vernal pools at Grasslands Regional Park relative to those elsewhere in the state, 
Um, for those that saw Eva Butler's talk um, earlier in the series, uh, she had talked about how vernal pools are throughout the landscape, not only in California, but also across the U.S., and that many the main characteristic that defines a vernal pool is often just that vernal or ephemeral nature of having pools that are wetted for a portion of the year and dry the remainder of the year, and the drying of those pools being um, primarily, if not exclusively, through evaporation. And so um, that's one of the commonalities that kind of is systematic across vernal pools. But at the same time, vernal pools um, have aren't just one thing. It's just like a river system where they each have their own unique qualities and they're very much based and shaped on the underlying geology and the natural processes around them, as well as how they've been impacted by human management over time. So in the context of the vernal pools that are at the um, Grasslands Regional Park, I don't know, okay, I mean, there's my arrow. Um, so Grasslands Regional Park is located in the Solano Calusa Vernal Pool region as defined by Holland. Um, and that geographic area includes kind of the geologic features um, that span through um, Calusa, Yolo, and Solano counties. And um, to get another perspective of it, if you look at the aerial photograph, the aerial photograph that's in the lower right-hand corner of this slide, you'll see the vernal pools that are within the Central Valley that have all been highlighted in yellow. And um, those that are on Grasslands Regional Park are way up here on the east, on the west side. Um, and I wanted to show these as um, probably to give a little more context on some of the similarities, but also the differences of these pools compared to others in the region that folks on, on, this, um, uh, on this webinar might be familiar with. So um, those that are located, the vernal pools that are located on the eastern side of the Central Valley, um, that would include the ones that are on McClellan, Howard Ranch, Table Mountain, Phoenix Field, if folks are uh, familiar with any of those. Those are all hard pan based vernal pools. They either have volcanic underlayment or are granitic in nature because the sediments that um, contribute to the hard pan of those vernal pools are being um, are primarily from the Sierras themselves. Whereas those that are on the eastern or on the western side of the Central Valley are coming from the coast range and have much more of a clay alluvium um, soil and geologic feature to them. And so um, the resulting feature of that is that the hard pan pools that you find on the eastern side of the Central Valley tend to be clear water pools. You can see through them. They tend to have aquatic underwater vegetation um, and uh, are kind of some of the more kind of quintessential vernal pools that people see when they see uh, the, the flowering rings that go all the way to the basin of the pool itself. Those that are on the western side of the Central Valley, those clay alluvium pools, such as Grasslands Regional Park, tend to be much more turbid because they have really, really fine clay silts that um, create the underlayment for the pools themselves that hold water. Um, so you can see in this larger aerial photograph um, here, the source of the sediments that are creating the vernal pools at Grasslands Regional Park and also those at the Thule Ranch site, for those that are familiar with that property, are coming from primarily from Puda Creek and then also historically from Cache Creek as well. Um, in this aerial, you can see in the very, I can get my mouse to show on the screen. You can see in this very northern um, corner of the aerial photograph, this little green ribbon is Puda Creek and it's as it's coming through um, the Blue Ridge Berryessa and dropping down into the valley. And so you can imagine as the floodwaters are coming through in the wintertime, um, prior to a lot of the alterations that we've made to Puda Creek and other systems, um, the floodwaters of the system would be draining out in a fan across the, the valley. And so those that are on the southern, the floodwaters coming out on the southern end of Puda Creek would be overtopping the main channel bank and would be essentially crossing across the valley in kind of a southeasterly direction. So across, spanning across Grasslands Park and, and Tule Ranch as well. And you'll see in a, another um, site-specific uh, image that I have of kind of that trending towards the southeast. Um, Jepson Prairie and Burke Ranch, they're also uh, clay alluvium based systems, but I think something that makes them very different from those found at Tule Ranch or Grasslands Regional Park is 
the underlying um, geologic factors involved. This, the area where Jepson Perry and Berg Ranch are located have had a lot of geologic uplift over time. They're actually considered very old vernal pools and that the systems that uh, allowed for the floodwaters to spread over those sites and create the, um, the underlying hard pan that allows for the vernal pools to be created in the first place, um, those areas were actually separated from their floodplain hundreds of thousands of years ago. So as there's geologic uplift, the elevation of those pools essentially became higher than the surrounding floodplain and disconnected so that no additional uh, clay alluvium silts were being added to that system. Um, they're also in an area where they actually are much larger pools. You'll hear about Ellicott Lake um, and some of the other pools at Jepson Prairie really are large systems, either ponds or lake sized systems, whereas Grassman's Regional Park um, is very different. It, it is what's considered a very young vernal pool system in that it was getting contributions of uh, alluvium clay from Puda Creek up until the time where we really um, started building levees and dams. And so, uh, whereas the Jepson Prairie pools were really the, the feature that stopped them or kind of encased or froze their period of, of when they stopped forming uh, or transforming as vernal pools happened due to geologic um, features and geologic timeframes, the factors that um, ceased the alluvial uh, contributions to Grassman's Regional Park pools were actually based off of human inter intervention um, as we put up levees and dams. And so it's really just in the last 150 years um, that we've really separated uh, the, the pools from their sediment source itself. Um, and you can see this uh, slide essentially shows what I had mentioned before about the, the pools themselves um, being much smaller than those at Jepson. They're also really um, fitting in when, within these like upper elevation from a micro topography standpoint. These sites are really relatively flat when you're out there, but um, when you're looking at vernal pools, you have to think of it as micro topography and every inch counts. Um, so in this site, um, at Grassland, you see when you're out there, you can see that there's a channel that essentially trends from the northern portion of the site, curves around down to the center of the property, and then again goes towards the southeast. Um, and the areas on, on this map that are shown in blue are the vernal pools, and then some of the mesic wetland areas are in that lighter green color. So you can actually see that the pools on the site aren't uh, as much as what you would classically think of as a pool, but really they're depressions within a historic swale. Um, and so that impacts the way that plants evolved on the site because it really shows there's a lot of connectivity between these micro depressions within the pools. And it also provides for opportunity of a lot of variation. Instead of having one large pool, you have lots of smaller pools. And so the depths of water um, and the rate of evaporation at each of these pools occurs at a slightly different time um, in each of the systems, which provides some opportunity for the plants. Some years, when, when they're dry years, they'll do better in the deeper pools, and the wet years will do better in the shallow pools based on the timing of when the plants naturally germinate. And so um, the plants themselves that have survived in this area have evolved to uh, be able to adapt to that process. Um, so this slide, it's just wanted to show you kind of on the ground, what does this clay alluvium look like and why is it different? Um, you can see in the top left corner, uh, there's a lot of silt in the system. It is very turbid. Um, it's the reason why in these pools, you don't see underwater vegetation growing up while the pools are ponded. Whereas in Phoenix Fields um, and some of the McClellan pools, you'll actually see vegetation that survives um, underwater the entire time. And these sites, the only vegetation that you see when the pools are ponded are the Caluso grass and the Solano grass. So the Neostapia Clusana and the Tectoria macronata, which are the two um, extremely rare grass species, which make this site particularly unique. Um, and especially the Solano grass, because this site has the only uh, known really viable population of Solano grass. There have been a couple uh, individual plants and very, very small populations identified around Olicott Lake and Jepson Prairie, but this site has, is the only one that's had a substantial population that's ranged in the tens of thousands at times and down to a few dozen in other years, depending on the water year. And so, um, and so the way that these two 
um, very distinct grass species survive in this system is that they're able to germinate underwater, which very few uh, non-aquatic plants can do um, in a very turbid system where they don't get much light and they're essentially shooting up their leaves as quickly as they can to find the surface and um, have a leaf that's up above the water surface to be able to photosynthesize. And so you can see in this top photo, um, it's relatively shadow water, water, but it's still very turbid. Um, and these little tiny leaflets are coming out um, and germinating and establishing while the pools are still wet. Down here, you can see kind of the next phase where the pools have dried down. Um, you can see how much clay is really in these systems and that there's a huge amount of cracking that occurs um, as the, the soils, the clays in the soils are shrinking pretty dramatically. And you can see that the, the surface is relatively even. Um, there's some kind of wind action and, and micro topography, but other than the cracks, the, the surface of the um, soil is generally flat and the plants are only surviving on that very top layer. You'll never see them, um, or I haven't at least to date, um, seen them actually survive in any of the cracks. You don't see the plants germinating up like you would um, some plants in a sidewalk crack or something. Um, and so this location is, um, if you go up to the top right-hand corner, you actually see this is the middle of the pool. It's the depth, um, the main um, deep areas of the pool. Something that makes the Grasslands Regional Park kind of unique is that um, in these systems, the centers of the pools are usually deep enough, and because of the timing, the timing of, of the dry down of the pools, and then also the alluvium and the um, cracking nature of the soils and the high boron content in the soils that are around here, um, those living in Davis, um, who have lived in Davis long enough to get their water from just groundwater prior to getting water from the city of Sacramento might have had house plants die or or be yellowy tinged like mine were um, from the high boron content in our groundwater. And um, these areas kind of experience the same thing where a few plants are surviving because of that. Um, and just because of the harsh conditions that these plants, um, these two grasses have managed to survive. And then um, in this lower photo, it's just the mature Calusa grass. Again, very similar. This is Solano grass at a much younger stage in the, the bottom left and the bottom right, you see the Calusa grass when it's mature. Um, the Solano grass when it's almost mature is on the, in the far right hand corner. Um, but in this, this slide, you'll also, or in this photo, you'll also notice that um, all the Calusa grass is occurring directly on the very top level of, of that soil. Um, and you can see there's a few depressions here, but not many. Those are actually, I believe, coyote tracks. Um, and there aren't any plants that are able to survive in that area. And so um, when folks think about management for this particular property and these vernal pools, um, one thing that I've gotten questioned about over and over again is why don't you graze in these pools? Isn't that something you're supposed to do in vernal pools is to graze because it's good for the, the plants? And and my primary response to that is that it's good in pools where that historically has occurred. There are many vernal pools, and I would say most of the remaining vernal pools in the Central Valley have had grazing for decades, if not 100 years. And so the species that you see there are the ones that have been able to persist with that impact. And so um, if you want to maintain those species, then you want to maintain the management practices there. This particular site has not had grazing in the middle of the vernal pools or has had very, very minimal grazing in the middle of the vernal pools. There definitely has been grazing in the upland areas um, and it's been pretty consistent uh, at least for the last 10 or 15 years. And I think that's um, generally helpful because there are a lot of non-native annuals. Um, there's stars of soil, there's a lot of annual grasses. Um, and those areas of the site can handle it. But when you're talking about the pools themselves, um, the reason why these grasses are still here and why it, maybe why it's one of the only sites that has them, um, one of the reasons is just what the current status of the, of the site is. And so if you start punching deep holes, you run the risk of potentially eliminating the habitat that's left for these very rare species. Um, so in terms of uh, 
why we still have these sites, this particular site in the pools the way that we do. Um, here's a aerial photograph from uh, 1937. It's the earliest aerial photograph or any photograph that I've seen. There may be others that are non-aerial photographs of the site, but um, the the reason why these pools have persisted is kind of a combination of um, the land use practices that have occurred over time um, and, and how humans have interacted with the space. Um, the Patwin people were the original residents in this area. I don't have a whole lot of information regarding their use of the property or the site or this or the general area at large, although I presume that since it was at a time when there was still a lot of flooding that they weren't actually residing um, in this specific location, but may have been using the plants and the animals that were occurring on the site. Um, since that time, there have been, um, in the early 1900s, there was dry farming that was occurring on the property. You can see from this aerial photograph that um, because they didn't have laser leveling at that time, there was some infilling of depression areas, but a lot of the areas that have the deeper depressions and where the, the main vernal pools are on the site were just avoided. Um, and you can really see that kind of in that lower quadrant over here that crosses between the Davis site and grasslands, which is the largest and primary pool. You can also see some of that uh, at the very northern portion of the site and then um, kind of in the center of what is Grasslands Regional Park. So um, kind of just south of where what's now the Aerial Modelers Glider um, launch and then the Burrowing Owl um, easement area that John will talk about. You can see there's um, kind of a depression zone here that crosses the property and a little bit of a remnant one that's on the southern half. And that's actually where there was a vernal pool restoration effort that I'll mention a little bit later on. Um, and so what, what made this site different than other sites? Because there were a lot of other sites that were uh, farmed in the early 1900s and then eventually and have continued to be farmed or otherwise were developed. Um, the difference is the same as what happened with um, the vernal pools on McClellan is that this property was acquired by the Air Force. So this site, um, the full section, um, so both book, book halves, um, were acquired by the Air Force um, in the late uh, 1940s, I believe it was 1948, um, and the site was acquired as a satellite site to the McClellan Air Force Base for telecommunications. And so there was, as you can see, early on or kind of in 1937, you can see there was a home site on what's now kind of the main parking area around the Bowman's uh, archery area in 1952. You can kind of see there's a remnant there, but the um, Air Force's main communications facility, which is like a 29,000 square foot concrete building. Um, I, got, I went into it a couple times before it was demolished. Um, was constructed on the site as well as an entrance road. And then um, in the 1960s, I don't have a, a aerial photo from that time, um, but I'll be able to show you some of the remnants of it. Um, there were, a, there were uh, large antenna pads and antennas for radio global communications that were installed on both halves of the site. And so, um, while I don't have the antennas, any photos of the antennas themselves, this is a a photograph or compilation of what the actual building used to look like. And then the lower two photos are showing the remnant in infrastructure that was there in the early 2000s of the antennas that had been taken out, but they left the pads in place. Um, so in the 1970s, the uh, Air Force decided they were gonna surplus the Western side of the property. So that's essentially what you know now as Grasslands Regional Park is everything on the western half of the section. And um, over time, there are various interest groups, um, clubs, organizations, interested individuals that approach the county about using the site for various, um, various reasons. I'd say the um, Bowman's Archery Club became one of, probably, I think one of the first um, clubs or entities to establish facilities on the site. Um, they primarily developed the grove of eucalyptus trees and uh, majority of the vegetation that's out in the far, in the far western portion of the property. Um, there's also the Aero Modelers Club, which is located just to the east of the Bowman Archery area. Um, there's some horseshoe pits. There's um, 
there were some folks that were doing dog trainings out there for a while. Um, there's been a dog park that's been created. There's kind of a, a variety of different uses out on the site. Um, and then in 2005, um, my predecessor, Brett Williams, had worked on developing a parks master plan um, in coordination with ESA, so Environmental Science Associates, um, as well as Quest to Engineering. And so uh, this map is, is not exactly what you see on the site today, but it was kind of a, one of the visions of trying to have some cohesiveness amongst um, the various uses of the site. And then also recognizing that there was an intent to eventually transfer or surplus the, Davis, the adjacent Davis communication site. So the 2005 master plan is kind of the first document that um, tries to look at both of the both halves of the overall section as a single unit um, and included some trails and recreation, but then also acknowledged the importance of the open space areas. Um, while Brett was the resources manager for the county, he also conducted a couple controlled burns on the Grasslands Park side, um, I believe kind of in the northern corner and then down where the dog park is. Um, and then um, I think may have been was also doing some invasive species management, primarily the star thistle, I believe in the um, open space areas. In 2006 um, was when I started working for the county. And one of my first interactions with the site was the arson fire that happened in 2006. Um, the, um, there's an arsonist that went through the county. I think they hit like six or eight sites. This was one of them. And it actually ended up um, being a great opportunity um, in many ways because what it did was it the site had had um, a lot of annual grasses, a lot of star thistle. Um, it was very there's a lot of thatch build up, and the fire essentially uh, eliminated a lot of that, and it provided an opportunity for some of the native forbs that were on the site to come up. There were a lot of poppies, some red maids, um, lupins, and other plants that. Um, suddenly came up in the uplands areas. And then on there were also areas where there was a bunch of creeping wild rye that showed up that was naturally occurring, but had been hard to see amongst everything else on the site. So um, we saw it as an opportunity to kind of see how we could further the natural management, natural resources management on the property. The county acquired a grant from the Wildlife Conservation Board to do both um, grasslands restoration as well as invasive species removal in the, the vernal pool wetlands. So one of the things we did was, um, first thing we did once we the site was burned, we could suddenly see all this remnant infrastructure from the old antenna paths were still in place. And for anyone who's tried to do large scale restoration, it's really hard to drill seed native grasses when you have rebar and giant concrete piles buried everywhere. So um, one of the first things we did in the upland areas was to remove a lot of this old like concrete and metal infrastructure that was left behind. Here you can see a, a truck of uh, a truckload of random debris we found out in the upland areas of the site. Um, if you go out to the site you'll still see there are some areas where we did not remove things, uh, concrete that's in the vernal pool area or some of the mesic areas or around areas that we know are some, there are sensitive plants. Um, we chose not to remove. There are also a couple sites um, on the eastern side of the Davis site where we also left some of the materials in place because um, there are active burrowing, there are burrowing olives that have been actively using those sites. Um, the squirrels took residence around the concrete and uh, made really good homes for the burrowing owls. So in those locations, we left the materials in place, but in a lot of the open space areas, um, we took them out so we could do more productive restoration. Um, so just to give you a sense of what has happened on the site and how it's changed, um, here's a photo from 2004 that was taken by ESA staff member showing the field of star thistle that was next to the Davis communication site. Um, I have other photos, but these ones, the building photos are the ones that are easiest to reference because you can tell where they are. <laughs> so that's why I use those ones. Um, and here in 2008, that's the uh, second year where we actually were doing active management on the site. You can see uh, significantly reduced star thistle, um, a lot more of the grass is coming in and then the poppies as well. In the vernal pools, there was a pretty significant effort to deal with the perennial pepperweed. Perennial pepperweed is one of the species um, that 
is one of the only species other than the solano grass and calusa grass that have been able to really invade the deep areas of the vernal pools. Um, down in this lower corner is the, uh, a photo of one of the channels, and this shows you it's really kind of a channel versus a pool um, that's just completely inundated with perennial pepperweed. And then um, this is after the second year of treatment. You can see that the pepperweed is significantly reduced um, and you're getting a lot more open water access, which works, which is suitable habitat for both slalom grass and calusa grass. And then you can also see we did some um, weed whipping in the kind of mesic, more upland areas. And so there's a lot more gold fields and other um, vernal pool associates that would come, that came up. Um, here's just a list of some of the native plants, so native grass seeds that we used um, for the site. Um, and in our first year, in 2007, our first planting, we drill seeded um, using the drill seeder from the Lower Poudre Creek Coordinating Committee and put in 2,800 pounds of gra native grass seed um, into the site. And that went on for, I believe, three more years after that to kind of work through portions of the site. Um, and then this series, again, it's the same kind of vernal pool. Lots of perennial pepperweed, the first year of treatment, the second year of treatment. And then I included this photo because it really shows, you can tell where we just went in and weed whipped um, like a six to eight foot swath right next to where that cha active channel was. And it provides the opportunity for a lot of the native um, vernal pool plants that you would see in a lot of other vernal pools that are, are really kind of on the upland edges. Um, we're able to come out. I wanted to find, there's a photo I have somewhere that shows, I did some control plots of uh, areas where we didn't weed with versus ones that we did. And you could see like 80% uh, Italian ryegrass is very leggy, uh, um, leggy gold fields kind of poking through. And then the areas where we weed whipped um, show up a lot more like this, where you have kind of almost 90 90% plus cover of the gold fields and they're much shorter stature, what you would tend to see in other places. Um, and then, as I mentioned previously, there was this one portion where there was a vernal pool restoration that was done. This was led by John Gerlach, who is a biologist that specializes in vernal pools. And um, it, 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 to me at least, I don't know how often this happens in other places. It was a really unique and interesting opportunity to do a restoration. I think a lot of times when people talk or think about vernal pool restoration is more trying to create or mimic vernal pool conditions um, in a site that didn't historically have them. In this situation, we're actually looking at an area where uh, sometime in the early 1900s, someone had just filled in a depression. They didn't, they didn't impact the hard pan itself. They just put fill soil on top of the pools so that they could dry farm on them. So what we did was, um, and what John Gerlach did and led the effort on was um, a combination of looking at the historic aerial photography, looking at soils maps and doing soil cores, figured out kind of where the historic signatures are, were of those big, big <coughs> sorry, of the vernal pools that were buried um, and actually mapped them out and had them excavated so that they once again can hydro hydrologically function as vernal pools. Um, those areas were the first uh, reseeding efforts for some of the um, grasses that were collected on the other from the other vernal pools on the site. But other than that, there was no other planting that was done on those pools. And so, um, again, for those that had listened to Eva's um, fascinating talk about um, how far um, some of the species vernal pool species can travel from from one pool to the next based on either being carried by birds or or other animals or wind and such. Um, these the pools that you'll see, um, if you get a chance to go out to the site and, and actually look at them or through the virtual tours, the pools, the vegetation, and then also um, the aquatic species that are, are managing those survive in these um, restored vernal pools or ones that were introduced to the site by natural means through animals or wind, um, wind derived and not by people. So. Uh, I always find that fascinating because it's only been a few few years um, in the life cycle of a vernal pool and they've filled up with a lot of things. Let's see. And 
And just to wrap up, um, I just wanted to show you some eye-catching photos of what's out there beyond um, the two native grasses. And um, just so folks know, every single photo that's in this presentation was actually taken on the site, not at any other properties. So um, while these aren't the most showy pools in the world, um, they definitely have their years when they're um, wetter years and the conditions are right. They can um, be very showy. And then even when they're not the most showy from a distance, if you take the time to look at them, there's a really a lot going on in them. Um, so a lot of the classic vernal pool plants you can see here, this is a mature Calusa grass, Solano grass, and um, the Dunningia, the tidy tip, um, butter and eggs. Um, there are also quite a few bird species that use the site as kind of a wetlands area during the winter time. Um, those that are in the up, upland grasslands, um, burring owls, which John will talk more about. Um, there's definitely the poppies. There's a lot of the kind of common forbs you'll see. And then um, in a lot of the areas, um, when I was managing the site, I'm not sure what's going on right now, but um, one of the things I tried to be careful of was to make sure to manage it in blocks and leave some areas of the site that weren't grazed so that in different times, like different areas of the site still had some of the tall vegetation so that species such as Northern Harrier um, and others that uh, utilize those tall grass areas for nesting and then also some of the rodents. So the rodent population had some cover um, and some places to reproduce so they could continue to be a food source for the raptors that use the site. Um, and then another thing that I think is really important about vernal pools and grasslands, the site and others, is that it really provides a sanctuary for a lot of native pollinators, both in terms of um, food sources for those species, but also um, hab nesting habitat as well. So here you can see, um, this I thought was a good photo in the top corner because it has the poppy with a solitary bee, but also you can see the tips of the poppy have been cut away. Um, and down here is a, my really, really dirty hand. I think I was pulling up thistle that day, um, but my really dirty hand holding um, kind of the, what was left from uh, a solitary bees nest, leaf cutter bees nest um, that I had found on the site that had been the um, the young had already left the nest and so um, just the fact that there's this undisturbed area that doesn't get tilled every year provides um, a lot of habitat for all those ground ground nesting pollinators um, and a lot of the vernal pool plants themselves really rely on those specialized pollinators as well. Um, so I wanted to wrap up and um, with that, just wanted to acknowledge there have been a lot of people that have done work on this site and, and trying to protect and manage the natural resources on the property. John Gerlach, I had mentioned previously is up in this corner. Um, he is responsible for a lot of the hydrology monitoring on the site, as well as the vernal pool restoration. Um, in, instrumental in a lot of the research that's been done on the site in terms of the vernal pool areas and, and also the establishment and protection of the clues of grass and salon grass. Oops. Uh, Joel Peppers, who was my fearless Yolo County staff um, site uh, assistant who helped with some of the original pepperweed uh, eradication efforts. Um, I also want to give a shout out for Tanya Meyer at the Yolo RCD who kind of took on um, continuing to battle the pepperweed on the site after I left um, her and the other, R there are quite a few Yolo RCD staff that have been involved in this property and they've um, all done great. Um, but Tanya has had a, a special passion for pepperweed removal on the site. Um, John Anderson, who's, um, who's since passed, unfortunately, with Hedro Farms was instrumental in, in assisting with identifying native grasses and forbs associated that would be appropriate for planting on the site um, and also assisted with a lot of the collection and reseeding as well. Lower Pretty Coordinating Committee, uh, Lee Hazeltine, he was one of the first grazers who put up with all of the um, instructions I gave him on when to flash graze and where to go and not to go and um, all the details. Brett Williams, who kind of really initiated a lot of the efforts on the site. Uh, John, who will be speaking in a moment. Um, and many others. And so hopefully um, some of you also who are listening to this presentation will be inspired and uh, will join the efforts. So with that, thank you very much. And I think uh, 
I'll turn it over to Sabrina and uh, I think I'm gonna stick around for questions after John's talk. Is that right, Sabrina? Oops. Thank you, Chris. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay, thank you so much, Chris. Apologies for the sound at the beginning. Um, Chris, we did have some questions come in. If you're able to stick around, I'll have John continue mm -hmm. and we'll uh, take questions at the very end. Thank you. Um, so John is going to talk about the burrowing owls on the site. And so John, let me just uh, give you the go ahead to share your screen. I think I, I think I have it. So there I'm gonna go, go ahead. You. Pop it up here. Thank you, Chris, for that wonderful background. And John will now give you some details about the burning owls. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks for that, Chris. I was found it very fascinating um, because I honestly didn't know a whole lot about the, the history of the vernal pools out there, nor the site history uh, prior. So um, very enlightening for me. Um, my nose tends to be a little focused on um, not so much the uh, vernal pool ecosystems out there where the grasses or the other plants, um, a, a little more of the mesic grassland areas associated with the grassland uh, regional park, um, and uh, more specifically the, 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 the vertebrate biota that, that occupy there. So uh, my head, head tends to be up out of the pool and into the sky a little bit more. So thanks for that, Chris. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk to you tonight uh, about the burrowing owl, uh, specifically the uh, western burrowing owl. Um, so there are uh, two subspecies of burrowing owl in, uh, uh, the, uh, in North America, um, collectively known as Athena canicularia. Um, the western burrowing owl, which we'll talk about today, is, um, is a subspecies, uh, uh, Hypogea, and then there's the Florida subspecies, which is um, we can't think of the, the subspecific name at the moment, but, but anyway, we're going to be focusing on these guys today. Let's see if I can get a cool laser pointer effect there. Yay! Um, so uh, burrowing owl, if you're not familiar with it, is a pretty small owl. It's one of the smaller owls in North America. Not the smallest, but one of the smaller ones. Um, about nine and a half inches in height. Um, it's got these long legs uh, with some modified hair. Uh, like feathers that cover them, makes them look very long. Um, and it has a nice round head uh, lacking any real horns or ear tufts uh, uh, up there. Has those nice bright yellow eyes, um, prominent white chin stripe here, and then these eyebrows. These are all kind of dead giveaway when you're seeing this bird out there. Um, honestly, when you, when you see it uh, on the ground, uh, standing near its, its cover, um, that's pretty much a, a dead giveaway as well. But uh, if you happen to see one that's um, you know, sitting up in a tree, for example, you might be uh, tempted to confuse it with something else. Um, the overall color is, is very appropriate for a ground dwelling bird, uh, kind of sandy, buffy in nature, spotted, um, a uh, few stripes here and there, but the backs of the wings uh, certainly have a, a, a quite a bit more spotting as we'll see here in a bit. Um, not a lot of dimorphism between the sexes, uh, male and female. Um, there is, a during certain times of the year, the, the females tend to be darker than the males. Uh, males will appear lighter. Uh, that's largely as a result of uh, weather, uh, sorry, weathering of the feathers uh, of the male as the male doesn't spend a whole lot of time underground. Um, in fact, doesn't spend much time at all. Uh, he'll stand guard nearby or, or by the entrance to the natal burrow, um, delivering food to the female. Um, and while he's out uh, bleaching himself in the sun and crashing through the grasses to chase down prey items, uh, the feathers tend to wear out and become a, a kind of a lighter color. So um, that can be a, a, an indicator of, of which sex of the species you're looking at. Um, but otherwise, pretty difficult to tell the difference. Um, Juveniles are uh, like their adult counterparts, but they're uh, a little more uh, whitish to buffy on the chest. Um, and they lack that modeling. They're a little more uniform in color. Um, so here are some pictures. Again, I was talking about the spotting on the back of the wing and the back of the bird. Um, and then the underside has this nice um, kind of buffy appearance on the underside of the wing, slightly yellowish. Um, perfect uh, cryptic. Um, uh, patterning for a ground-dwelling bird, for sure. Uh, here's a juvenile 
Um, and you can see the breast is uh, more uniform. There's no spotting or, or uh, streaking there. It still has those white eyebrows, uh, the white chin, of course, those, those glorious eyes there, um, in this case, uh, looking as fearful uh, or, or fearless as possible in the hands of a researcher. Um, distribution of burrowing owl in uh, North America, as I'd mentioned, there's two distinct subpopulations, um, uh, subspecies, the Florida population out here in pink, and then the Western, which occupies the majority of the Western areas over here. Uh, the salmon color area to the top is breeding habitat. Uh, the pink is uh, permanent residence. So we see both breeding and wintering. Uh, and then the blue down here in New Mexico is largely um, uh, non-breeding resident, but also wintering birds from northern latitudes. And they are a migratory uh, bird, so they will uh, migrate from, from southern to northern climates to reproduce and then uh, make the return trip um, down to better climate uh, during the wintertime. Um, however, where we're located here in California, we're right in the middle of uh, kind of this transitional area between resident, year-round resident uh, breeding and migratory. So we see uh, some shifts in, in our populations throughout the year. In California specifically, you can see uh, where uh, burrowing owl habitat occurs, uh, where they range. Uh, green here is year round. Uh, so these would be year round permanent. Um, yellow would be more of a wintering um, habitat, slightly higher elevation, could even be um, uh, some local birds that are breeding in the valley, moving upslope. Um, um, you know, just accessing different uh, foraging resources. And then we have some temporary or transient populations during migration and the um, kind of the, uh, the plateau region up in the northeastern corner of, of California there. Um, don't know why in this map Imperial County is highlighted, but um, uh, it is. And actually Imperial County is, is one of the hotspots for burrowing owl at the moment, California. In fact, it is probably the, uh, the main population of Burrowing Owl in California is, are, are down in the Imperial Valley. Or the Imperial Valley. Um, so state, uh, statewide status in California, they were uh, formerly very common in appropriate habitats. Um, their numbers recently in the last probably 10 to 15 years um, have, have reduced markedly. Um, they uh, have extubated in, in some of their uh, habitats um, especially along the coast in, in uh, desert and central valley areas. And unfortunately, in, uh, that means uh, the numbers in this area in particular, we've been watching decline um, over the years as well. Um, especially the last several years, it's been uh, quite alarming to see how uh, few breeding birds we now have in uh, Yolo County. Um, but the, as I mentioned, down in the Imperial Valley, down in the southeastern portions of the desert, the state, uh, the populations are considered uh, stable, if not increasing slightly. And a, large, a lot of that is due to agricultural expansion down into the desert. So um, water reliant and certainly um, uh, it, having a, a potential challenge with climate shift as, as we see uh, water become a more scarce commodity. Um, habitat requirements, um, they are a um, uh, uh, ground nesting bird, as I had mentioned. So they're uh, looking for uh, short open grassland as a primary habitat type. The desert scrub is also preferred. Uh, they're looking really for kind of low stature um, or, or you know, highly grazed or disturbed sites. They utilize natural and artificial burrows, um, primarily fossorial mammal burrows down in, in the ground, but they'll certainly utilize um, uh, you know, human created things as well uh, when they are uh, available. Um, and of course, they, this is probably most important for them aside from natural or artificial burrows is, is ample nearby foraging habitat. We're noticing as um, foraging habitat is converted, um, previously occupied nesting sites uh, are uh, becoming abandoned. So we're, we're kind of fearful that that is uh, what we're seeing here in Yolo County is a lot of conversion of ag uh, agriculture into orchards, maybe uh, fanning the flames of some of uh, the extirpation that we're, we're noticing. Um, uh, foraging habitat is equally important, especially during the winter time when we see all these wintering uh, migrants show up in the valley. Um, they're utilizing open grasslands and agricultural fields. Um, and uh, burrowing owls primarily are eating small rodents, uh, small birds, insects, 
lizards and snakes. And insects are actually super important for uh, uh, during the breeding season, um, which is, is kind of interesting for a raptor species. Um, here is burrowing owl sitting next to its natural uh, burrow habitat. So this is a most likely, well, it's definitely a fossorial mammal burrow. Um, it's most likely a ground squirrel, California ground squirrel um, here in the state of California. Um, that's the primary um, host, if you will. They're the ones that do all the digging for them, at least up in this neck of the woods. Down in the southern part of the state where the, the soil is a little sandier and easier to move, the owls can do a little excavation on their own, but they're primarily relying on other animals to dig it for them, dig their burrows. Um, uh, interestingly, on the uh, east side of the um, uh, Rockies, where you get into, um, uh, you won't see as many ground squirrels, but you definitely see ferrets and prairie dogs, and and they're uh, they're they are very important for burrowing owls for for burrow development. Um, well, that's interesting. <laughs> He just got really big. Okay, so some of the artificial burrow types uh, include uh, human uh, created or made. Uh, in this case, this is just a green irrigation valve box. It's buried about two feet and we put a section of uh, corrugated pipe about eight feet. And uh, this is something we've used around the city of Davis and certainly out at the Grasslands Burrow and Owl Preserve um, to help uh, bolster the availability of suitable burrowing habitat. Um, and, and certainly try to attract owls out on the site and get them to breed there. Um, and they will use these pretty quickly. The only challenge is, is um, we're learning that uh, these can be a little bit of false sense of security if, if there's just artificial burrows and not enough natural burrows and ground squirrels out there. These can fail over time. They can become full of dirt or they can fill in with rainwater. Um, they're no longer available and then you might lose your breeding population. So um, a mixture of artificial burrows and natural burrows is definitely ideal. Um, there's also uh, different types of cover that they'll utilize. Um, in this case, these are two burrowing owl down in the gutter by a drain inlet. So this is a stormwater drain inlet um, and then just some random debris on the side of the road. Uh, that this pair here has discovered and decided was a pretty nice place. Now, the challenge and the hazard with these are obvious. We have, uh, you know, uh, potential for collision with vehicles here with those guys and here um, moving uh, this debris off of there could certainly cause some problems for them. Um, so uh, the primary threats for burrowing owl, uh, habitat loss and conversion. That's, that's number one, certainly in Yolo County. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, conversion of grasslands, historic grasslands into uh, agriculture um, and then uh, agriculture into residential housing and urban development. Um, certainly there's a kind of a new, and I mentioned it before, a, a new concern, which is conversion from row or alfalfa type uh, open croplands, uh, which are uh, abundant with potential prey items for burrowing owl uh, and converting those to uh, uh, less diverse orchards, which can be uh, problematic, um, not quite as much food available for them. Um, ground disturbance, uh, disking, that's uh, disking or grading. So for the example here, you got a, a disker going through and this could have been an occupied uh, field and certainly it could entomb those animals or, or physically you know, cut them in half. So that's a problem. Domestic animals and cats, uh, burrowing owl will utilize urban areas. Um, they are fairly tolerant when they're in urban areas to human encroachment. Um, unfortunately, they're also very tolerant to uh, human associated activity like dogs and off-leash dog movement. Um, so that is a problem. Dogs will get them every now and again and certainly cats can. Um, human disturbance, again, primarily during the nesting season. So that encroachment moving up to them, uh, trying to disturb their, um, or not trying to, but unintentionally disturbing their, their breeding cycles. And then vehicle collisions. Um, a lot of owls uh, uh, seem to, to fall prey to vehicle, motor vehicles, um, especially on highways or uh, busy interstates where um, there's a lot of light and the light attracts insects and insects then collide with vehicles and flop around dying on the road. And then you see those owls going in after those uh, and also becoming victims of the, of, um, of the vehicle. So um, lots, of, lots of things out there to get these little guys. Uh, they are protected both under state and federal uh, protections in the state of California, just general protections under uh, Fish and Game Code, which protects birds of prey, uh, their nests and their offspring. Uh, but they're also a species of special concern, which gives them additional um, protection or consideration, especially when 
um, a project uh, or action is being investigated under uh, the Environmental Quality Act. Um, uh, federally, there are a species or a bird of conservation concern, which is very similar to a uh, species of special concern, gives them additional protections. Um, and then they're also protected under the Federal Migratory Bird, bird Treaty Act. Um, uh, all of these basically say that it's illegal to take uh, the adults, the young, uh, the eggs, um, and then under CEQA, because of this uh, species of special concern status, uh, they you have to consider uh, habitat loss and um, the impacts associated with that as well. Um, I should add too that they are a, a species covered species under the YOLO Habitat uh, Conservation Plan, Natural Community Conservation Plan. Um, so uh, the Yolo County Grassland Brewing Out Preserve, which we're here talking about, um, you know, first when they asked, uh, uh, Yolo Basin Foundation asked me to come talk about brewing owls, it was like, okay, well, yeah, there's the brewing owl preserve down there, but this is the Vernal Pool Speaker Series. And, and I was like, well, what's the nexus between Vernal Pools and, um, and burrowing owl? And, and I think it's clearly grasslands, right? So, uh, you know, Vernal Pools are a, uh, micro system within a larger grassland system. Um, burrowing owls don't necessarily use uh, um, vernal pools. Um, in fact, they don't find very good cover in the vicinity of them just by the nature of, of where that hard pan or, or sediment depression is. It's, it's, uh, it floods obviously and, and certainly flooding and, and uh, burrows in the ground don't mix very well. Um, but they are found nearby and they will certainly access any prey items that might be uh, supported by vernal pools in that system. So there is a relationship for sure. Um, the uh, Brewing Owl Preserve at the Grassland site uh, was established in 2004 uh, as a partnership between Yolo County and the city of Davis. Um, the city was actually interested in uh, obtaining some land to mitigate the loss of some uh, burrowing owl habitat locally within the city of Davis. Um, a, and uh, the, the uh, Yolo County had a very nice uh, grassland system with an existing breeding pair, or not breeding pair, but breeding colony of uh, burrowing owls. Um, so when we acquired the land, the arrangement was 63 acres of annual grasslands. Um, 33 of those would uh, uh, fulfill our uh, mitigation need to, to, for the loss of, of habitat uh, through the construction of Mace Ranch Community Park in the city of Davis. And again, we selected that site due to the suitability of the grassland system, um, uh, the natural uh, burrow, um, ground squirrel population that was there, and the existing um, uh, burrowing owl, uh, sorry, breeding burrowing owl colony that occurred on the nearby uh, model air, uh, airplane runway. Um, the, uh, the, the basics of that relationship uh, and to fulfill the, um, uh, the obligations that we had under CEQA to mitigate the land, um, we have had to come up with a monitoring and management plan. Um, and it, it's really uh, the management plan for that 63 acres is very burrowing owl specific. Um, uh, maybe to a fault, but certainly to the benefit of burrowing owls. Um, and I will mention that burrowing owl habitat management is actually very, very um, um, harsh uh, when it comes to na a native grassland system because it requires constant input and certainly a high level of disturbance to maintain. Um, here is that 63 acres in the green um, and it's broken into a series of areas. The city's mitigation property is the 33 acres in the, in the center um, and then Yolo County retains um, the, uh, uh, there, there is no easement uh, on, or maybe there's a, I think there is a habitat easement on A and C here um, that will eventually at the county's um, ability to, to maybe go off for additional mitigation for other projects. Um, uh, the city's uh, agreement with the county in acquiring the 33 acres was to maintain and work with them to monitor and manage the entire 63 acres. So um, that's what I do when I'm down there helping out. Um, I feed a lot of that uh, monitoring information back to the county and work with the current county staff to uh, operate the grazers and mow if necessary. Um, and if needed, as Chris pointed out, um, control some of the more invasive weed species that are on the property. 
Um, monitoring requirements are, are pretty simple. Uh, we just need to maintain the vegetation out there at a height and density that's um, suitable for year-round occupancy or burrowing owl. So, so what does that mean? And, and really, uh, burrowing owl prefer, through much research, they prefer uh, shorter stature and, and not very dense, to, you know, sparse vegetation types. Um, so that is the goal of the management plan down there. And, and so when you are talking about uh, the vegetation height, it's easy to say, oh, we'll just go run the mower around there every now and again um, and knock it down to three inches or so. Um, but it doesn't always work out that way. Um, the vegetation can be so dense that, uh, you know, even mowing it down to four to five inches isn't uh, going to be super helpful. Or it can be sparse enough if you get a nice uh, established stand of native bunch grasses where you can have a six to eight to 10 inch uh, tall plant um, that's still uh, sparse enough to allow visibility. So what the metric uh, that was adopted for this site is called the effective vegetation height. Um, and essentially, and I'll explain that here in a minute, but, but basically it's, it's a measurement that takes into account both the height of the vegetation, but also the density. Um, and the, the concept is if you're an owl who's sitting on the ground, how far, uh, at what distance would you be able to detect a predator that might be trying to hunt or pursue you? Um, and, and therefore make your escape and protect your offspring, et cetera. So, so that's really the measurement. Um, so the effective vegetation height, uh, there's two metrics that we, are, are, uh, we need to, um, uh, to manage for out there. Um, uh, one is in the first half of April is the measurement we take. And the idea is, uh, is making sure the vegetation is nice and low prior to any chick emergence. Um, and that's about five inches uh, effective height. And then after, the summer growth of the vegetation and the annuals start to die off, the perennials begin to dehiss and, and fall down perennial grasses. Um, we're looking to kind of set the stage, if you will, for those winter migrants. Well, certainly, um, first of all, any um, dispersing offspring that might be breeding nearby, um, but also then um, to attract any wintering owls that are, are coming down to the valley from northern climates and looking for a good place to overwinter. Um, we're also maintaining a burrow density uh, and our goal is to get five suitable burrows uh, per acre out there and they could be both natural and artificial. Uh, we really haven't had much of a problem with maintaining uh, that burrow density. Uh, ground squirrels are, are very abundant out there, quite dense uh, and uh, natural burrows abound. Um, um, and suitable burrows uh, are burrows that are, are a certain diameter, about four inches in diameter, um, that they have a you know more or less uh, 20 to 30 degree approach ramp that goes into the burrow, not straight down or, or straight back, maybe a little bit of a burrow or mound development in the front of it. Those are what we would consider uh, suitable and they're certainly abundant out there. Um, and then we also are tracking burrowing owl currents. So while we're out there taking these measurements, uh, we're uh, looking for signs for owls and actually sign as we're moving through. Um, I'd mentioned the effective vegetation height. Uh, this is the uh, measurement. It's basically taking this board that has one inch um, squares on it, um, setting it out in the vegetation, reading it from 10 meters away at about one meter off the ground. And the effective height is the point on that board at which 90% of these squares are obscured. Um, so basically 90% of that horizontal uh, uh, field of view is obscured. And basically, again, what you look where we're kind of doing is mimicking if we're an owl sitting there in the vegetation, can we see a predator um, at that distance? Um, and then would we be able to safely take evasive action? So that's effect, That's the effective vegetation height measurement. Uh, management techniques. Um, so again, as I said, it's pretty intensive to keep the vegetation down uh, out there, especially when there's very productive grassland uh, and, uh, and, and in particular in wet years when there's a lot of rainfall. Uh, drought cycles have been a little easier to manage uh, for vegetation because uh, the grass doesn't grow quite as thick or, or as, as um, uh, quickly. Um, but when it, we do need to get out there and knock the vegetation down, grazing, mowing, and prescribed fire are the options. Less so in prescribed fire, uh, grazing and mowing are the pre preference. Uh, and the county has a very uh, active and um, helpful uh, grazing contract right now 
um, with John Hayes. I'm not sure what the, the his company is called, but he is the uh, the grazer, and they run sheep out there. And that grazing has been wonderful for keeping the vegetation in within the suitable realm. Um, but there are some problems with grazing out there, um, uh, which uh, include primarily compaction of soil um, and then also uh, some destruction to the natural burrows out there, especially when there's some soft soil conditions. So we have to be very careful about that. We also want to encourage ground squirrels, uh, try not to manage um, them on the adjacent uh, properties. So the uh, I guess on the property, but the adjacent interests, as Chris had pointed out, there's a lot of different interests out there. Uh, the Bowman's Club, the Aero Modelers Club, the dog park, you know, hiking, recreation, bird watching. Um, and the Aero Modelers aren't, you know, they, they are happy to have to share their space with, uh, with the ground squirrels, but they do grumble quite a bit and they do ask the county every now and again, what can be done to help control their numbers. And so uh, we have to be careful and try to find out ways to help them, but to also balance those interests with making sure that there's plenty of ground squirrels out there digging holes for bur burrowing owls. Um, the other option is to uh, install artificial burrows, but again, I mentioned there are some complications with that. And then uh, limiting human activity out there is certainly um, uh, 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 an important action as well. Um, so a matter of example, we've been monitoring this area since 2004. Um, a matter of example of, of last year's measurements, um, we had about three inches effective height in the spring measurement, 3.6. So grazing has been super helpful for that. Um, burrow density was 7. Point, uh, you know, almost eight burrows per acre. So we're, we're certainly uh, seeing lots of ground squirrels and lots of available burrows out there. Um, we're still, after all these years, not seeing any breeding owls on the 63 acres, unfortunately. Uh, but we do see a very high abundance of transient burrowing owls during the winter, um, which is really good news. Um, you know, I think last winter I was out, there was 18 um, burrowing owls out on the site uh, spread around. That included, um, you know, the part of the, the model up runway um, and then the adjacent site near the solar panel site. So uh, there is a high uh, there is quite a few of them out there during the winter time. The problem is, is we can't get them to stick around and, and breed. Um, and I'd mentioned before we selected the site based on the, the nearby breeding population that was on the model runway, um, model airplane runway. Um, and unfortunately, within a couple of years of establishing and setting up the Berwyn Owl Preserve, um, that population uh, disappeared. They just kind of dwindled. Uh, I think there was about six breeding pair and they went down to two the next year and one breeding pair and then they were gone after that. And um, unfortunately, we, we don't know why. Uh, the management of that site never changed. So, um, it, you know, it, it's the same kind of question we're all asking ourselves now. Around that same time, uh, we saw numbers breeding, uh, the number of breeding burrowing owl in Yolo County um, and certainly the, the northern uh, Sacramento Valley decline. Um, and, and so we're left scratching heads wondering why. They're still breeding, I uh, still find them around, just not as dense as they were. Um, and with that, I think I can give the power back to Sabrina and we can entertain some questions. Thank you, John. Thank you, Chris. Um, we'll go ahead and go back and forth between Chris and John. And John, I'll start with you while Chris uh, brings back up her screen there. Um, okay. John, do the owls eat the squirrels to take over the burrows? They don't, um, and probably thankfully so. Otherwise, it'd be kind of like shooting themselves in the foot because they rely on those squirrels to do the, the, the hole digging for them out there. Um, so they are, I, there, there's a relationship there. Um, I wouldn't call it may, maybe mutualistic. Some, some might argue that, but um, ground squirrels not only dig holes for them, but they're also very aware of the surroundings. They're constantly looking for, um, you know, aerial predators and ground predators. Um, and burrowing owls will alert to ground squirrel calls, right? So 
if the if the uh, uh, burrowing owl is is unaware of a potential hazard and it hears the the ground squirrel squeak, it will react like all the other ground squirrels out there and take cover because it knows that's a problem. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to having those ground squirrels around. Um, there is, like I mentioned, a little bit of love-hate where squirrels can evict owls out of their nests. So they can and will, and they do. Um, and it's unfortunate because you'll see uh, within the fresh tailings in front of a ground squirrel burrow where you knew there was a nest there, there'll be egg uh, fresh eggs and nesting material. Um, and, uh, you know, fortunately, I don't think the owls can win that fight. The ground squirrels may be a little more aggressive and, and capable in that regard. But for the most part, they're able to live side by side uh, quite well. So a question just came through that follows up from what you just said. So, yes, the owls and squirrels cohabitat in the burrows. Yeah, they can actually use the same burrow systems. They'll use different sides of it and different entrances. Um, that's where you'll see a lot of fights occur is when, uh, I mean, I've seen ground squirrels run into an, uh, an active natal burrow just to turn around and come, you know, shooting right back out of there with, with the female hot on its tail. Um, and likewise, I've seen a burrowing owl uh, duck into a satellite burrow that had a ground squirrel in there. And the reverse has happened where um, it's come shooting out. So they use different entrances to complexes, but they do find that they can be within that same connected complex, just using different sides of it. Great, thank you. This question is for Chris. How does Cache Creek affect the vernal pools at Grasslands Regional Park? Um, it, it doesn't anymore, but historically, um, some of the flows, flood flows coming out of Crash, Cash, excuse me, Cache Creek and the drainages um, during kind of really wet winters would actually um, distribute some of the sediments from Cache Creek down south and actually across um, the kind of Poudre Creek floodplain area. So just imagine if you didn't have all the levees and houses and infrastructure that we have across that portion of Yolo County between Cache Creek and Poudre Creek, you could envision um, really large flood flows coming out of the coast range um, in both of those systems and essentially the flood waters combining and some of the sediment mixing. And so that's how it would occur. It would only be when the, the Central Valley is essentially fully flooded. Great, thank you. John, where do the burrowing owls get their water from? Uh, burrowing owls will they, they don't really need an open source of water. Um, they get pretty much all their water requirements from the prey items they eat. So, you know, juicy voles and juicy lizards and juicy bugs. Um, they, uh, I suppose they can take open water if it's available. Um, they've seen them in, on lawns actually while sprinklers are running. Um, and then during rain events, sometimes you see them out kind of hopping around looking up I don't think they're drinking the water. I, maybe it's a type of bathing. I'm not sure what the behavior, behavior is. Um, but to answer the question, they meet uh, all of their water needs from their prey, from the prey that they consume. Thank you. Chris, you did touch on this a little bit, but can you go into some more detail on how fire affects vernal pool plant diversity? Sure. I mean, the. Um... And I'm not an expert on, on fire management, so I'll give that disclaimer first, but um, it's similar to the upland grasses as well as the vernal pool areas, um, where depending on the timing and the duration of, of fire, um, you can often impact the distribution of the plants that are in the site. So for example, um, kind of one of the issues that we've seen at Grasslands Regional Park and the vernal pools around there um, the two, two of the species that are impacting the pools directly, one are the, is the perennial pepperweed, which is directly in the pools themselves. Um, fire doesn't really impact them all that much because they have a very deep root system. So um, when there has been fire on that site, they generally just regenerate in place um, because the root system is deep. But there are um, another species that has been kind of invading the fringes of the vernal pools is the Italian ryegrass, which essentially just outcompetes a lot of the kind of obligate or kind of 
associate vernal pool plants that are found in in kind of the fringe area. So kind of the popcorn flower, gold field, deningia, kind of the standard vernal pool plants that you would see um, in a lot of areas that create that kind of ring of color. Um, those oftentimes just get crowded out when um, Italian ryegrass kind of occupies and kind of takes over a site. So fire is a good way of both um, removing the thatch that's built up over time as, as the annual grasses have senesced. And then um, it also provides, kind of just opens up the area and depending on the timing of the fire, um, it can uh, open up the area so that the native forbs can actually grow um, in enough time to, to get large enough that they make it um, beyond where the annuals are. Thank you. On that note of management, uh, John, how do you decide between grazing and mowing? Well, it's been pretty easy lately because we found um, uh, the, well, the, count working, the county's contract with the grazer down there. Um, they, they have a good partnership and <clears throat> he has quite a few sheep, um, which he can keep out on the site during the strategic points of the year. So, you know, early spring and then in the summer, trying to get that, that, um, that late season growth knocked down. <clears throat> um, when, let's say, uh, and, and that's been easier, I th would say during um, the drought, unfortunately, because uh, the, the, the vegetation out there hasn't been as vigorous in its growth, and it's been easy to maintain with the sheep. Um, but during, you know, high rainfall years, I think there was one few years ago where we saw the sheep couldn't keep up with, uh, with the vegetation, and, and we were at risk of, of m missing our target. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, and in that case, we uh, would employ uh, a, a mower uh, to go out. And that's, it's, it's a lot of work. It's, it's, it's a large area. <laughs> 63 acres of mowing is, is a several day job. And um, as Chris had pointed out uh, earlier, there's still a lot of little hidden hazards uh, out there. So um, it can be kind of hazardous for the equipment that you're dragging around out there as well. Um, <clears throat> but that's right now it's the, uh, the free element of grazing, which is very attractive. And they do a great job, the sheep, when conditions are dry. The, the challenge is just when they, um, when, when there's any moisture in the soil, uh, the, the sheep can actually put their feet through the tops of the burrow chamber um, and then water, the next rain event will channel water down there and it will destroy that burrow. So uh, we've noticed some of that, not quite as, you know, it's not a problem yet, but we can see if, if we, you know, graze it too hard during wet years, that could become a challenge. Thank you, John. This one's for Chris. Have you noticed turbidity between vernal pools or between years of looking at vernal pools, since you mentioned how turbid they could tend to be? Um, I I'm guessing that the question means, have you seen like variation in turbidity? Right, variations in turbidity. Okay. Um, yeah, the, there's a couple of different things that lead to turbidity. Some of it is just that the fact that there's a lot of really, really fine silty clays in, um, in the soil layer. So once it gets wet, essentially gets suspended. It's kind of like if uh, you've ever done ceramics and have had that like water bucket that you're constantly going to to work on your clay piece and then you find at the end of the time that you're working your clay piece you have a very turbid bucket <laughs> of fine silt material it's kind of the same thing that happens with the vernal pool so there's some uh, suspension that pretty regularly happens in these systems no matter what um, things that exacerbate the turbidity um, are a variety of factors that could be um, the size of the pool in terms of the amount of surface area of the soil versus the amount of water that's in the pool. Um, wind can definitely um, create um, essentially motion within the water column in the pool, which then turns up sediment. Um, and then also things like waterfowl are a big component. When there are waterfowl in there that are going, I didn't mention much about um, the tadpole shrimp or or um, fairy shrimp in those pools, because I think the previous speaker um, spoke about them. Um, but they're a huge for food source for a lot of 
um, waterfowl. And so when the waterfowl go in there and they're essentially looking for those food sources, they're actually stirring up the sediment, whether it's with directly with their feet or just through moving through the system. So there are quite a few different factors that could uh, impact the amount of turbidity in the system. Thank you. John, what types of predators will dig up the burrows? Um, it's a good question. I, I think um, historically in the Central Valley, it would have been um, American badger would have been the ones that would primarily excavate a burrow um, and go after them. That probably still happens, although we don't see Badger as in the high densities as, as we used to because of, for the same reasons conversions of, of grasslands. Um, I think now, uh, especially with you know the coyotes uh, expansion into uh, the 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 valley, they're probably number one right now as far as ex excavating out a um, a den or <clears throat> pardon me a, a, a nest bro. I, I think what they're more exposed to. Um, would be uh, reptiles, uh, snakes, go for snakes, rattlesnakes, <clears throat> getting down there and discovering the eggs and consuming them. Um, the female is pretty protective and she can defend it to a degree, but sometimes that, that occurs. And I think that's probably the number one, uh, would be the number one challenge for uh, nest predation within uh, the, the Central Valley here. Um, the adults themselves and then the offspring once they emerge, uh, it's, they're fair game to all, all kinds of things. Coyotes being uh, one, but certainly aerial predators. Swainson socks, uh, unfortunately, you know, they're, they're a great bird and, and there's management concerns associated with them as well, but they're also, they have a, quite an appetite for burrowing owls. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One last question for each of you before we wrap it up. Um, we. We're not able to get to all of the questions, but most of them, thank you. Um, so we can finish by 8.30 here. Uh, Chris, did you seed all of the sections of the vernal pools that you weed whipped? We didn't seed any of the areas that we weed whipped in the vernal pool. So um, the areas that we planted the native grasses and forbs and kind of that table that I showed was just in the upland areas of the site. We didn't um, do any active planting in any of the existing vernal pools. We we're just doing management to essentially try and to the extent feasible eliminate or reduce um, the populations of both perennial pepperweed and, and Italian ryegrass. Um, it's going to be an ongoing management thing because they're both species that are on the adjacent properties and so they'll find their way back even if you eliminate all of them. Um, the only seeding that we did do directly into the, any of the vernal pools was in the restored pools. The ones that um, had soil that was previously kind of filled, um, that filled in the vernal pools in the early 1900s, and then we excavated them. Um, those excavated fills, the sites where we excavated the fill from, so they'd have a, a similar contour to what they historically had. Those actually had the uh, Calusa grass and Solano grass seeded, but um, those were the only species. Thank you. John, could the burrowing owl population decline over the last decade or so be connected with West Nile virus or drought conditions? Um, man, I wish I had an answer to those. I, I think those are two um, going, you know, discussions uh, about what has been causing the local exploitation here. Um, I, I think it, there's a there's a possibility West Nile virus had a, 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 an effect on them. Uh, the challenge is we don't really know. Um, the, you know when burrowing owls get sick, they're, they go underground and they perish and they're pretty difficult to discover and test to find after the fact that what it succumbed to, right? Um, there has been some interest in doing some tighter testing on uh, live samples. So taking blood, blood tests from living burrowing owls in the area to see if they have antibodies uh, to West Nile. And, uh, you know, if that's the case, then there are, some may have been impacted, but there was enough that made it to, to continue forward. Um, you know, I think, uh, I, I think that could be a factor. It could, it could also be the conversion of, um, you know, recent, relatively recent conversion of, of a lot of the ag, open ag fields to uh, orchard uh, types. 
uh, if you think about uh, their prey items, you know, orchards don't really produce that much uh, for burrowing owl. And it certainly is uh, difficult for them to go in foraging around in there um, versus a uh, open agricultural field where there might be more uh, arthropods and, um, you know, small mammals and, and lizards and that sort of thing. Um, so, so I think that conversion may be also kind of fanning the flame, but, but I, you know, I think West Nile had to have had some sort of influence on there. The, the trick is we just don't know. We don't have enough data to support that. Well, thank you so much, Chris Alford, and thank you to John McNerney for these fascinating talks tonight. I know I have learned new things tonight, which I love about this job. Thank you to all of you for joining us. I hope that you'll be able to join us for our virtual vernal pool tours on May 8th. That's a Saturday morning, as well as a, or, or a Wednesday evening on May 19th for a virtual vernal pool tour. We also have our next vernal pool speaker series with Carol Witham on the plants of vernal pools on May 11th at 7 p.m. Uh, stay tuned for our BAT programs to be available for you for sign up for this summer with a virtual talk and a visit out caravanning out to see the Mexican three-tailed bats that fly out from under the causeway. And our summer camps are also open this summer. We have in-person and virtual opportunities for our kids. Thank you all so much. Have a great night. Thank Bye -bye, you, everyone. everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.